right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I am joined by a special guest today, Kevin Palmieri. Kevin, thank you so much for joining the show. Scott, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm grateful and excited to see where we go. Oh, this is going to be amazing. So before we get started, a little bit of background on Kevin. Kevin is the founder and co-host of the Next Level University podcast. Early in his life, Kevin found success, but after a brush with suicide, he realized he wasn't living a life he truly wanted. He became passionate about self-improvement and decided to make it his purpose in life to impact as many people as possible by becoming a role model podcaster and speaker. He has succeeded to make his podcast one of the top 100 with over 1,100 episodes and listened in over 125 countries. He has taken his life to the next level and achieved both personal and professional success. Uh, Kevin, <laughs> uh, like unbelievable, by the way, just as someone who I, I love the country part of that, but 125 countries is insane. Uh, I think my end goal is like 100 countries would be amazing. At, at one point, I was in 40. So I can only imagine like what that is to be at 125. So that that, that is really amazing just to hear well, that thank first. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Again, it's uh, one of the things I always say, Scott, and I think you'll appreciate this. Where I am today is not where I started and where you are today is not where you are forever. So please do not hear that and say, wow, I could never do that or whatever. We've just been doing it for a long time and we've been doing it very consistently. So I always like to throw that out there because I think it's important just for a context. I love that. So uh, you hit on one of the major topics already uh, as I go through, but I want to start preface. Let's let people know who you are. I know you used to, you used to be a trainer. Uh, our trainer used to be a trainer. And so let's go back on your background and your fitness background. We'll kind of get started with there. So how, first off, how'd you get into the fitness industry to start? Yeah, I was, oh man, I was probably 15 years old. I oh, was the same height I am today. I think I was like five foot four. I probably, no. weighed yeah, yeah. I probably <laughs> weighed like 135 pounds, maybe 140 pounds. And I was sick of being the little guy. I was just sick of being a little, a little kid who felt like he was going to get picked on and I went to the I walked down to the gym long before I had a a license and I signed up and it was myself and two of my buddies we would go every day after school and we had no idea what we were doing we were doing everything incorrectly of but course, yeah I, I have very good genetics I'm I'm blessed that my dad was a very large human being even though I and I'm happy to go into this too I didn't know my dad I didn't meet my dad until I was 27 but he was a a large man who was very 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 strong and I definitely got some of that genetically, which I'm very grateful for. So I loved the gym. I loved fitness. I loved lifting heavy weight because it was just really grounding. It was like therapy, right? The the weight oh, just doesn't great. care. Yeah, it just doesn't. You have a good day? Cool. The weight's heavy. You had a bad day? Cool. The weight's heavy. It doesn't, it just doesn't really care. So from there, I actually went on to start practicing mixed martial arts. Oh. So I wanted to fight professionally. That was my goal for a, a period of time. And I was like, this, this UFC thing looks really cool. I'd like to try this, right? My grandfather was a boxer. It makes sense. Let's do this. So I trained for two or three years and I ended up tearing my shoulder, which was a whole thing. So I couldn't do it anymore. But I eventually ended up going and becoming a personal trainer because I thought I love the gym. If I can get paid to be in the gym, why not? I'm going to do it. Why not? And I found this job at a, it was a very small boutique personal training business where you literally had your own room yeah. in the studio, right? It was, it paid really well. I was like, awesome, let's do this. And I had to sign a contract when I, when I signed up, they said, in order for us to train you, it's going to require you to sign a contract that you'll stay for at least a year. And I was like, all right, whatever. And they said, oh. if you break the contract early, you're going to have to pay a thousand dollar fee. And I was like, well, that's not going to happen. I'm going to love what? this. This is going to be awesome. What? I've never heard that before. Yeah. It way. was upon further evaluation, there was some shady stuff going on there, but I was probably like six months in and I had already had my pay cut at least once because I was just horrible at sales. And they were just like, Kev, you got to get sales. You got to get sales. Like make these people hurt. So they'll sign up for more packages. And I was like, uh-uh, I can't do that. So one day I walked in and I said, hey, I'm done. I'm not, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. And they were like, okay, so you do know you're going to have to pay us $1,000 if you want to leave. 
And I was just like, cash or check. I don't, whatever. I don't I, care. I would have said, blow it out your ass. I was <laughs> like, yeah, good luck. Good luck suing me for the thousand dollars. Well, I was afraid. I assumed oh, like they, they probably know something. I don't, There's, they're going to take me to court. Like, even, even non-competes in the fitness industry. Like those don't even like, in my yeah. opinion, like those don't hold up very well. It's yeah. like, come on, like a thousand for what? Like not wanting to be in your business. Training, like, get out of here. training. Yeah. We invested a thousand dollars into no. you and you, you know, but no. so I ended up leaving. I quit and I was like, I I'm done with this. I'm done in the industry, quote unquote. But then I think like four or five years later, I was in a gym working out. Somebody came up to me and said, Hey, you should do bodybuilding. And I was like, okay, well, cool. What does it mean? And they're like, I'll connect you with this person. He'll be your coach. I was like, all right, cool. And that coach didn't work out, but I signed up to do a natural bodybuilding show. I ended up prepping for whatever it was, eight, nine, 12 weeks. And I ended up winning my division. And that was an interesting experience. I was prepping for another show. And then I had a pint of Ben and Jerry's in the freezer from a cheat meal. And I just woke up one night and I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I went downstairs, texted my coach and ate all the, the Ben and Jerry's. And that was kind of the end of like What's your coach bodybuilding. Say? Yeah. The bodybuilding. Uh, he was, he was understanding. I had a very, I had a very good coach who was like, he was just a really good, a really good human. And he was just one of those coaches that was like, if you want to win, you'll suffer more than anybody else. If you don't want to win, you know, this, this isn't going to be for you. you know, when when you say bodybuilding, by the way, you're talking, cause there's two different types. There's bodybuilding where like you're, you're, you're big, you're a big dude or physique show where you're a lot more. Okay. So you're, you're lifting heavy ass yeah, yeah, yeah. weights. Like you're, cause like some people like physique show is like where you like, you see those people who are just ripped on stage and bodybuilding is like those power lifters who are beefy, yeah. heavy lifting ridiculous. Okay. Just to yeah. verify that. Okay. No, yeah. it's good. It's good. I mean, I was, I have pictures on my Instagram. Like you can see every vein in my, legs like my quads oh my were like really i had really 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 good legs but i realized this probably isn't super good for my mental health so after that i swore off bodybuilding forever and then i just kind of i train i still train muay thai on my own i still lift i still love fitness it's just not not like it used to be it's not part of my job it's not it's not as much of my identity i mean it still is but i consider more like health of I consider brain health. I want to sleep enough. I want to drink enough water. I want to make sure I have micronutrients. Like I'm considered that more health than I used to. I love that. Um, okay. So how'd you get into, I guess, from fitness to podcasting? <laughs> Where's that trans? You know, we're missing a couple of years here. Where's that transition? Yeah. Uh, my buddy who also was a fitness competitor had a YouTube channel and he was like, Hey, I want you to come on and I want to talk about health and I want to talk about fitness and I want to talk about mindset. And I was like, all right, I don't know what this is going to be like, but let's do it. We talked for like an hour and a half. At the end of that, I said to one of my other friends, I said, imagine if you could do that for a living. And he's like, I mean, you can, there's people that do that. And that planted the seed for me that interesting, this podcast thing is a thing. I, so that year after, so it was, that was towards the end of the year, I made the most money I had ever made that year. And so I made a hundred thousand dollars at 26. And I opened my final pay stub and I was thinking to myself, I've been chasing happiness for so long. And again, I'm happy to go into all this, but I've been chasing happiness for so long. And I just made the most money I've ever made. And I have a sports car and I have all this money in the bank, but I'm like pretty miserable, I'm a pretty miserable human being who's not super excited for life. For most of my life, I've lived unconsciously, like just kind of going through the motions. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. The opposite of unconscious is hyperconscious. I had that thought paired with the podcast thing. And then I started the podcast, I don't know, two or three months after that. And that was like, interesting. I can talk to people about deep stuff. Ooh, I like this. And that was a, that was a huge thing for me. So when you, I want to, I want to dive deep into this now. So when, when you talk about you were living unconscious mm. and, I, and I happen to think that this is something that a lot of people do as they just kind of live and yeah. they, they get into this routine and they wake up, they go to work, they come home. It's just this, this is almost not that it's dull or bad or anything, but people have this, that sense that you had of unfulfillment, not happy, just kind of living to almost just surviving. So what, like, what is living unconscious exactly? What does that mean? Yeah. For me, at least it meant not questioning anything, just assuming the way things were or the way things were supposed to be. And like, I had a belief that I, you're not really supposed to like your job. Like that was kind of my belief. I mean, that was conditioned into me that like nobody really likes their job or you're not supposed to. If you do like your job, that's a benefit. It's like an added benefit. That, mm. 
that and that becomes that kind of becomes your normalcy where you it just makes sense it's like oh, i don't want to go but i have to you're you're just living unconsciously it's just you're not questioning but why does everybody get in a car that they can't afford to drive to a place of employment that they don't like isn't that weird isn't that the weirdest thing ever like if you were an alien you flew down here wouldn't you wouldn't that blow your mind like i then i started thinking that way and a lot of it for me scott was joe rogan i mean joe rogan oh. Yeah, I was I was laying in bed one night and I was watching a an episode with him and his buddy Duncan Trussell and they were having that conversation of why do so many people hate their jobs? Not from the aspect of we're rich and we're wealthy and we don't have to dislike anything we do, but like why was it set up that way where it just became okay to be miserable for eight hours a day or 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week? Like why doesn't anybody question that? And I remember hearing that and something shifted. And it was like, I can't look at things the same anymore. And that was a really, a really big thing. So for me, living unconsciously is just kind of, you just go from one thing to another thing to another thing. You don't take a lot of time to be introspective. You don't take a lot of time to think of what does this actually mean for me? You're not asking why. You're not saying, why do I do this? Why do I not do this? Why am I attracted to this? Why do I run from this? Just trying to to dig beneath the initial layer figure out what's below that and then then you realize there's a lot more layers than that usually is there something that you know let's say someone's listening right now and they're like wow like i feel the same way like i should like why don't i i don't like what i do and it doesn't have to, by the way it doesn't have to just be your job i know we're talking yeah. about jobs specific, but it could be anything that you're doing it's like something's not right in your life are there some things that people can do to start kind of changing that unconscious behavior to the hyper-conscious behavior or thought process. Are there any like tips that you can give someone? Hey, like if you were to start to do these three things, it could help change that mindset. And so to where you could start making different decisions. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I would say is start asking why before and after you do anything, ask yourself, why did I do that? Why didn't I? That's a, mm. that's a huge thing. The second thing, and I, it's going to sound so simple, Ask your, you don't have to ask yourself, but think of it. How much are you learning on a daily basis? Learning is not just for knowledge. A lot of it is for perspective because when you learn something or you have the opportunity to create an input that comes into your brain, one of three things can happen. One, I know this already and I've been practicing this. Two, what is that? I have no idea what that even means. Boom, your awareness is now raised. Three, I have no intention or no interest in what I just learned. One of the things that I did that I didn't realize has helped me so much is I've learned every day for the last six years, like every day I, I have it on my, I have a habit tracker and every single day I check that off 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. It It's not that you're becoming, yeah, you're becoming smarter and you're becoming more knowledgeable, but what you're doing is you're becoming more aware. And then when mm. that, when you become more aware, you become more aware of yourself. And then when you understand yourself, you understand everything at a deeper level. So those are two things. And I would say reflect. I think a lot of us assume that all the answers for us are either in the present or the future, when in reality, so many of the answers are buried in the past. They're buried in the traumas of our past. And you are the way you are today, not based on what you did yesterday. It's probably based on something that happened to you when you were younger. You just don't realize it yet. And we think the future is going to change that. But for many of us, our futures are very attached to our past. We just don't realize it. So when you start to reflect on your past, you might have things that jump up. You might say, oh, interesting. I, I grew up without money. How has that affected me? I mean, how is that shaping my decisions to this day? And then boom, new awareness, new opportunity. And, and the same can be true about even like in, in the fitness and all. If you grew up in a family that ate fast food every night or your parents were overweight, like that probably had some sort of impact on kind of how you saw yourself and how you should be living your life. Yeah. Yeah. The, the inputs around us are, they're really, really, really affecting us way more than we realize. I love that. So you talked about how the past you know, basically you're living from the past and the experiences that you had can shape your future. So I want to kind of dive into that. So I know we talked about kind of in the bio there for a little bit, you had a brush uh, with suicide. So I want to kind of like go into that. At what point, because I know you were, you know, you did that training job, then you did bodybuilding and then you kind of went to the podcasting. At what point where, you know, and you were living unconsciously, so you were just, you were down, you weren't feeling the great. It's like, what happened in that moment? And how, how did you get to that moment? Yeah, so 
th- this all started for me when I was 25. When I was 25, if you looked at me, you, and this this was the interesting thing, you would see a man who had everything. My girlfriend was a model. I had just won the bodybuilding show. Ooh, okay. I had a sports car. I was making anywhere from 60 to $120 an hour, depending on where I was working for my job. Uh, you know, a new apartment. From the outside looking in, everything was 10 out of 10. You cannot beat a life like that. But truthfully, I was very unhappy. I was very unfulfilled. So one day my girlfriend came to me and she said, hey, I want to move from New Hampshire to California and I want to chase my dreams. And I was 25. And I gave her every reason in the world why she shouldn't do it because I was just so afraid to be left behind. Like if you go to California, you're going to find somebody else better than me. You know, I I don't want to go with you. I have this job. I have security for the first of my life. Here's a list of reasons you shouldn't do it. So she ends up breaking up with me as she should have. And she moves across the country. Now, I'm heartbroken. Work is slow. My bills just doubled effectively because now I'm living by myself. And I said, you know what? I should probably introspectively take a look at myself, but I'm just going to go make more money because more money's less problems. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on that. So the next year starts. I get a promotion at my company. So I worked at a company that our focus was weatherization. So all that means is we go into buildings and we make them more energy efficient. But I work on state-owned buildings, so I get paid by the state. That's why I make so much money. So that was the busiest year we ever had. I just got promoted to a foreman, which means I'm running a bunch of these jobs. Mm -hmm. If you fast forward to the end of that year, I had been on the road for 10 months out of the 12 months because most of our contracts were in other states. So I lived in New Hampshire. I spent most of the year in New Jersey, which is like seven hours away. So Sunday, I'd I'd wake up on in Sunday morning. I'd pack. And then I'd leave at like noon. I'd go to the office, I'd get the van and we'd drive six, seven hours to the job. I'd stay there Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Nice. And then Friday after work, Oof. we'd come back. And it was just that every week. That was just my life. But I didn't care because I was making I was making money and that was my goal. So we got to the end of that year. I had my final pay stub and I opened it up. You know, I, ma- I made the money. I said, I'm, I'm unconsciously living. The opposite of unconscious is hyperconscious. Podcast that started, cool. When I started the podcast, I fell in love with the podcast. And I had already fallen out of love with my job because I knew I didn't want to do what it took to make that money again. Because I was just over it. I, I can't live on the road for another year. So I start calling out of work. I start leaving the job site early. I start showing up late. I am not a model employee. And it got to the point where I would have to be in New Jersey at seven in the morning on Monday. I would sleep in my bed Sunday night, 9 p.m. until midnight. I'd get up. I'd drive six hours straight to the job on three hours of sleep. I'd work an eight-hour day, go to the gym. Like, I was just, brutal. I just need to be yeah, more brutal. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm dieting at some, you know, during some of this stuff. Like, I'm lifting heavy throughout this. So, it just was tearing me apart. So, I knew I, I couldn't stay at that job, but I didn't know what to do. And it all really culminated on a morning in New Jersey. My alarm clock went off at 5.15. I sat up. I slid to the edge of the bed. I was lacing up my work boots. And, excuse me, the best way to explain it is it felt like there was 10 televisions on in my head at the same time. And every single one was on a different station. And one is saying, you're stuck here forever. I know you want to leave, but you got so lucky by getting this job. Like, you're never going to get this again. You're never going to make $100,000 again. No college degree. Like, you got so lucky. If you do work up the courage to leave, what will your friends think? Because they all look up to you. You have nice things. What will your family think? You make more money than anybody in your family. And do you really think we're going to do this podcast thing? Like, we're going to leave this job and we're going to go all in on this podcast. Really? And in that moment, I felt that if I was to take my life, I would take my problems with me. Oh, wow. Okay. That was it for me is like, I am so stuck here. I, I can't, what am I going to start over? Like I found success. Everybody thinks I'm super successful. I don't want to start over. Now, luckily, my business partner, who was just my friend at the time, I messaged him and I explained to him what was going on. And realistically, he's been mentoring me since the beginning. I'm very blessed. And he said, Kev, over the last year, couple of years, your awareness, hyperconsciousness, has changed a lot, but your environment has stayed the same. I think it's time for you to change your environment. So I ended up leaving that job three or four months later and then becoming the brokest entrepreneur you can you can become and trying to figure out, okay, how do you grow a podcast? How do you scale it? How do you make money? How do you turn this into a business? And then that was it. That was in 2018. 
So that it's been every day since then. Wow. I love that. I mean, it just, it, and it goes to show, I mean, cause I think a lot of people struggle with that. And, and one of the, like just a handful of points there is one, people do feel trapped in what they're trying to do. And again, we're talking about jobs specifically, but this could have been almost anything. It could have been relationship. It could have been, you know, uh, your, your health, it could have been anything. It's like, you almost feel like, how do I start over? How do I do this? Because I built all this from the ground and I can't imagine having to start over at the, it's like, oh my gosh, like you're on the 20th floor. And it's like, I can't go back to, I can't go back to the, the first floor. Yeah. Like it's impossible. It's like, how do I, how do you leave all the benefits? How do you leave, you know, easy six figures? How do you leave? And it's, it's a great kind of story because a lot of people struggle with that on a regular basis. And I think that's also why people, you know, like you talked about on Joe Rogan, like people stay versus what you did. Most people don't leave. I would say most people are not like you who would, they stay and they stay for 30, 40 years. And that's why they're miserable because it's not actually what they want to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that goes into a little bit of kind of the belief system that they have in place. Like your friend told you that you became more aware, but your environment didn't change. And so I think taking that leap of faith was kind of, I mean, what most people are afraid to do um, in terms of just kind of building what they want. So I think it's a really inspiring story to be totally honest. I mean, I just, I love that story because uh, it's, it's great. Um, so going on that, you know, it takes a lot. So now, now you, you, know, you get past this dark time in your life and a lot of people, they might not be, have those kind of thoughts potentially, but they, they, there are people who go through dark times and everyone's got, everyone has their story. Everyone has their dark times that are going through from your experience, from, you know, your travels, as it were, through the internet, through the podcasting sphere, what are some of the most common limiting beliefs that people have that is stopping them from achieving whatever it is that their goal is? So regardless if it's work, relationship, mindset, whatever, right, whatever the goal is, insert goal here, what are the most common limiting beliefs that you've seen uh, mm -hmm. that people kind of show you? Or, or even in your training business, right? when you were training people, what are the most common, either way, it doesn't matter. I would say that it's, it's two. It's simple. It's either fear, fear of failure or fear of success. Uh, those are the the two. If I mean, if I was categorizing everything I've learned, it's number one, the fear of failure. I could never do it because I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not fast enough. I don't know enough about business. It's either, yeah, it's, it's really lack of enoughness is the biggest one. It's the biggest one. I, it's just so common. To the point where we, Alan and I, Alan's my business partner and co-host, we used to argue about it. He's like, he's like, what is the biggest issue in the world? And I said, it's lack of belief. And he's like, no, nah, I don't think so. And I said, well, the only reason you don't think so is because you believe in yourself. <laughs> but most people aren't like you. Like you believe anything is possible. You know, no, no, most people don't believe that because if they, if you don't believe something is possible, you won't try. And if you don't try, it can't reinforce your belief. If anything, it takes more belief from you. Right. If you don't try, it proves to you that you shouldn't have tried in the first place because you have to figure out how to make that right in your own mind. So the number one is lack of enoughness, the limiting belief of I am not enough. The complete opposite of that, which I never understood and I did not believe could be a thing, is the fear of success. Fear of success. Real, real quickly, before you hit fear of success, I do want to mm -hmm. dissect the fear of failure. Uh, and one thing is that what I found in my in my coaching and my training and, and kind of my journey is fear of failure doesn't necessarily show up as the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's your experience as well. It's like most people aren't walking around and go, oh my gosh, like I'm so scared of failing. What they do is they create a rationalization or they that's where the excuses come from. So mm -hmm. would you agree, it doesn't make sense in, in your mind that like if people are afraid of failing, that shows up as I don't have time. I don't have money. Yet. You know, I, how can I do that? It shows up as these rationalizations. Oh, I don't need to do this today. Or I don't need to go to the gym today because I've been so good the last four days. Or, hey, I can have that piece of cake because I've been good been good for four days. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that's how fear of failure shows up versus, oh my gosh, like I I, like, I just have a hard time. I, I feel like maybe because I don't do it, maybe like your business partner. <laughs> I, don't, I don't go around thinking, oh my God, I'm afraid to fail necessarily. It just comes up in different ways. I think it's definitely common, but I think you're probably in the minority. Okay. At least from from what I've experienced. Because I mean, again, you have a podcast, you very clearly believe in yourself enough to do 126 episodes. 137. Something like <laughs> not that I'm counting. Give right, or take. Right. Yeah, so you're, you're right. Congrats. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. But but most people aren't. I mean, I've studied podcasters for the last six years. Most people get seven episodes in and that's it. 
because really? something is missing. Yeah. The average, the average, and again, we won't do a lot of podcasting, but the average is seven to 21. Really? And then people, then people call it quits. Yeah. Wow. Probably seven to 21 exercise or workouts too. Right. Like, that's kind of, it's the the one to three weeks where you you start it, you get the good feels, you get the good vibes, but you see zero results. Like it's a dangerous place to live because effort versus outcome is very, very off. Do, do you think a lot of people are, do you think it's like an innate thing to be afraid of failure or do you think that's trained? Um, I think biologically it's innate because if you fail, you get kicked out of the tribe. Yeah. Right. Like just, just from an evolutionary standpoint, but when you're, a, when you're a child, you don't really, you don't ever think about failure. So I do think there's a weird time in your life where you finally cross the threat. It's probably when you get judged for the first time where you're probably like, Oh, failure equals bad failure equals judgment. I and think that's why. Yeah. yeah. And that's why if you're raised in like a, I mean, imagine this two people, one, you're raised by somebody who tells you, hey, you're not good enough, not smart enough, not pretty enough, not whatever, not enough versus, hey, you're incredible. And if you work really hard for for every, you know, every day for the rest of your life, you're capable of anything. Hey, I know you made a mistake, but it's not that big of a deal. Like get up and try again. You got this. Those are just two different lives because we're all being brainwashed in some way. It's either positive or negative. Really? Because what is, I mean, what are you supposed to think? I don't know. What's a normal thought process? I don't know. So I think most of it's conditioned because you can condition it either way. But I just, yeah, I think for most people, it's the, it's the fear of failure. I really do. Why don't people start? Because they're afraid to fail. If you don't start, you can't, you can't ever fail. You can't have that, that feeling of just like, oh my gosh, I'm not good enough. And it's just, yeah. And so yeah. uh, I love that. And I think that I think a lot of people here would resonate with that. It's like, okay, like, hey, like if you're trying in the, by the way, and I think this is a huge part of the fitness industry specifically because mm-hmm. that happens to be the specialty is they're afraid of failing. And it's like, it's hard to lose 40 pounds. It's hard to build muscle. It's hard to get in shape. It's hard to get that promotion at work. It's hard to keep that relationship. So it's, oh yeah, I won't even try. Oh, don't worry. I don't need to, I don't need to do that. And then you go home and you're, you're just, you're miserable. And with, yeah. because you're afraid of failure. Uh, let's touch on uh, fear of success. So yeah. let's dive into that a little bit. So, I mean, I understand fear of success, but for the audience, kind of what's your definition of fear of success? Oh man, it's most likely self-sabotaging your own success because you are afraid of, there's a few, I mean, there's a lot of different ways it can go. You're afraid of getting negative attention. You're afraid of finding somebody finding out the skeletons in your closet. The most common one that I have seen, and it's usually people who are very, confident you for most of your life have been confident and because you're confident people assume you're arrogant and because they assume you're arrogant they try to tear you down so you're afraid at a deep level if you become too successful you're going to get torn down even more than you already are so you avoid it that's a big one and then one of the other big ones is most people i won't say most from my experience many of the people i've talked to who are super growth oriented also leave people behind very quickly because most of the people around them aren't super growth oriented. So they have a fear of success because they assume if I succeed, I'll have to leave everybody I love behind, which honestly sometimes is true. But I, I have, I mean, my business partner is that that was one of his things is like, I've outgrown every person I've ever known. I'm afraid to outgrow you, Kev. Like what happens if I outgrow you? You know, that, that fear of what if I get, not too good, but what if I become too much? Or what, or what if it becomes too much that I can't handle it? And then it goes that's, back that's to it the too. fear of failure. Yeah. Wow, I, it's brilliant. That's it. The, the belief systems are like, I mean, just do think of that for a minute. If you're out there right now, imagine, and I know it's, it's you know, cliche and, and whatever, but imagine if you believed anything was possible, how would you live your life? Imagine if you believed nothing was possible, how would you live your life? Like that's, that's a really good understanding to have. Belief for most of us, I think, is the kryptonite. Even if it's, and this is the interesting thing, Scott, I know people who believe in themselves too much. So much, in fact, where they won't take action because they don't think they need to. But they do. They need to take action because they need feedback and they need to be humbled so they'll actually take more action. It's that weird thing where you can believe in yourself too much. You can have a, too high of a level of self-worth. You can. Because it forces you into stagnation you know i've had we've had people in our community who would come to us and say like 
you know, I'm in your group coaching program, but I should be really, I really should be running this. It's like, I understand what you're saying. I understand that you feel like you're maybe ahead of me or whatever it is, but you need to get into the real world and prove that because you're not in this, in this real world, you're not. In the sphere, yeah. In this sphere, I'm showing up every day and you're not. Now, am I saying you're not capable of it? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to prove to yourself that first because that delusion. I can't squat more than somebody who, I shouldn't be able to squat more than somebody who squats every day and is a professional at it. I, it's not, that's not the way the universe works, right? I don't deserve to squat more than Scott if, if Scott's out here squatting every day. I don't deserve that. That's not the way it works. So that's like an interesting thing is action is such a cure-all, but either you have, if you're on either polarity, you either don't believe enough in taking action or you don't believe you need to take action because you're already good enough. It's a weird thing. Yeah, and it's powerful too because it just it, everyone has something along. Everyone's on the spectrum somewhere, and it's just a matter of kind of and like you said earlier, bringing it back to the awareness part is how do you kind of get out of these limiting beliefs? Is awareness, self reflection, like what do you, like when you do something, what do you feel? Why did you do that? I just started doing this thing where I was like, okay, I need to, and not that I'm addicted to social media by any means. I don't, I don't have a Twitter. I well, I say that I have a Twitter. I don't check. Uh, I, you know, I have Instagram, Facebook, and that's really about it. I don't really do a lot of social media because I, I just hate kind of being on there. And I found myself just always on it. And so I started doing this. I started to self-reflect. Okay. Like, why am I always on there? I'm like, well, I'm on there because I'm bored. Well, I'm bored ish. You know, like, Oh, I gotta do something. And I have this need to be active all the time. And I'm like, I got to stop using this crutch to feed my need to always constantly just have my mind stimulated. So I've been making some, you know, that's my reflection that I had. And so now what I'm doing is I'm like, when I wake up in the morning, there's no fault. Like I am not, like, except for the weather, my alarm and turning on either music or a podcast like that to listen to no, no social media for like an hour, like nothing, no email, no nothing. Just so I can like start my day without having to get just absolutely destroyed by the screen. And I think, you know, a lot of people do that too. And it's like, oh my gosh, how do you, cause we're stuck in it. Now that's a very specific example, but everyone's going through something like that. And again, bringing it back, you know, to, if you love your job and you want to do something, okay, reflect, how do you make that better for yourself? What do you, what can you do? If you want to lose weight, what can you do? What are you not doing? And, and doing those self-reflecting because there's something going on potentially subconsciously that you're doing or thinking that you're not aware of. And the more you become aware, the more you can figure out, is it fear of failure? Is it fear of success uh, or somewhere in between those? Cause I think, I think you could boil almost everything down to that. If you want to kind of go through mm -hmm. the snake of, you know, fear of failure, fear of success. Actually, I think you could do fear of success inside fear of failure, to be totally honest. I think you can sure. uh, easily so umbrella that. Um, so I do want to segue a little bit, but you know, obviously consistency is a huge part of your business. You know, you have 1100 episodes and, you know, 140 countries. Consistency has got to be something that, you know, is a foundation of what you do. So I want to talk about how do people build consistency? Like what are some important steps and what is consistent? Like what would be consistency for them? Yeah. So consistency for you, if you're watching or listening, is you repeating an action often is the best way to think of it. Because I could say it's repeating a positive action often, but it's not. You can do negative things consistently too, right? If you hit the the drive yeah. through every day, maybe that's that's that. Yeah. Right? That, that happens. So, okay, simple. The simplest thing. I always say this, I preface it. Maybe this isn't right for you, but this is what's worked for me. And I think it's just real. I think it's just being real with yourself. The fear of not doing something has to be greater than the fear of doing it. So this is mm. what I have. Love that. I have something I call the hundred dollar habit. I have. So if you're listening, I have a hundred dollar bill on my desk. It's real. It's crisp. It's, it's in front of me at all times. I did a little experiment where a few weeks ago, maybe a couple well, at this point, maybe a couple months ago, I gave this hundred dollar bill to my wife. And I said, I am going to the, I'm going to go to the gym seven days this week. If I don't, I want you to rip this up in front of me. And she said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I said, I promise I won't let you down. I need you. I please, I need you. I need you to help me on this. And she's like, all right, cool. I didn't miss the gym. Why? Because it was worth a hundred dollars for me. Now, this is the interesting thing. It's not even about the money. It's about the fact that it's a visualization of me letting myself down. All right. A hundred dollars is a lot of money. Yes. But I'm not necessarily going to miss the hundred dollars, but that's something I can never take back. That happened. I, I quote unquote messed up and my wife ripped up a hundred dollars in front of me. 
That's one. So you call that's that a com- so- I love, it's, that. It's a, I love that. That's amazing. I mean, that's great. That's great. It's a I lot. It's it's a lot. And and I want to preface it too. That's why I said it's not for everybody. But all that is is a commitment device. So think of it this way. And this is a really good one too, if maybe that's not it. You make an agreement with yourself and somebody else that I am going to do this X amount of times this week, month, year, whatever, or else I am going to donate $20 to a charity I hate. We're in a very political society right now. Choose the chair, choose the side of the politicians you like the least and say, I'm going to give them a hundred dollars of my hard earned money. Ooh. I'm willing to bet you're, you're going to get up in the morning. I'm willing to that. bet. Right. So that's, a, that's another thing. I think we, we are trying to delude ourselves into thinking, well, you know, consistency, it should feel good. And I, I want to make sure I'm always doing what I want. It's like, no, I don't, I think, I think that's kind of a, an idealistic world that we're probably not going to live in because if we, if our results were at the end of the rainbow of doing what we want, we'd already have them, right? We'd already have our results because we're doing the stuff we want anyway. So that's an interesting perspective. This is the other thing. You have to build in accountability. Like who is in your life that you can, one of the reasons we've never missed an episode, Alan and I, since we've been together is because there's two of us. We've never missed, right? 1200, as of today, 1220 episodes, I think. But we've never missed when we were together. I missed on my own. Alan missed on his own with his with his show, I'm sure. But the second we partnered up, Scott's at the gym, I got to go. I, if Scott's at the gym, I'm going to go. If I'm at the gym, Scott's going to go. Like That's the way humans work. You will do far more some, for somebody else than you will for yourself. It's just mm-hmm. the way we're wired. So having some level of accountability is there as well. And you got to build that in. And there's this is the other thing. And I think people are really starting to figure this last piece out. In order for a human being to take a new action, they have to have three beliefs. They must believe it is humanly possible. They must believe it is possible for them personally, and they must believe it will be worth it. You are never going to do something consistently if you do not believe it will be worth it. You just won't because it would be nuts to do that. Mm -hmm. Why would you get up every day and run a mile if you didn't think it would be worth it at the end of the year? So I think when we're setting our goals, whatever that means, we have to figure out what would be worth it for me actually to do consistently. That's a whole, and that's a whole nother topic and that's deep. But I think a lot of us are like, it's like, well, I don't really want to do that. I don't really want the result. So there's no way I'm going to do it consistently. So just making sure you actually want the result, that's huge. That's a very, very big thing. And making sure in the depths of you, you believe it will be worth it. And you actually believe it's possible for you. You got to believe it's possible for you because if you don't, you're not going to take action. I love those three things, by the way. Uh, humanly possible, possible for you, and worth it. I, I, I mean, it, it's it hundred percent. I can't even think of another like that's a hundred percent sure in my opinion. And I, I want to bring it back to, and this brings me to the, kind of the next topic is when you when you do that. So let's say, and we, you know. Uh, New Year's, right? New Year's resolutioners. This is the most common thing you see. Mm-hmm. After about two weeks or so, it's like at most goals, like 75% of goals are already done. Just kaput, they're gone. And after a month, it's like 85%. And after six months, it's like only 5% are left that actually had a specific goal for New Year's. Most people, I, I imagine, when they set out those goals, one, they know it's humanly possible. Two, they probably they probably deemed it was possible for them. And three, they probably thought that it was worth it at the, at first. So, I, and I think most people lose that third string where it's like, ah, oh, this isn't worth it or something gets in the way. How do people go, you know, not allow themselves to quit when they first set out for a goal? So let's say they're four weeks into whatever goal they want to be, whether, whether your goal is in real estate, stocks, fitness, whatever, podcasting, you know, you're a month in, you know, we talked about seven to 21, you know, podcasts or seven to 21 workouts. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, let's say you're at that day 20 or day 21 or whatever it is. What, how do people go from that point of, okay, like it's still worth it. How do you revitalize that feeling? Cause it was worth it 21 days ago. You loved it. You, yeah. You're like, oh my God, I'm gonna get all, I'm gonna get the microphone. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work out, but all these workout gloves, like I'm gonna, do, but now 21 days later, it's like, is this how do you bridge that gap of like, it's still worth it? How do you get people to like real like to, to believe in themselves, I guess, even more that it's worth it? Because they know they know they can do it, but is it worth it? Yeah, it's one of those things where I I think a lot of us just come off the starting line too fast. 
So it's almost like if, if what you're doing is not sustainable, I don't know if there is a way to fix it, but really, and that's my, that's my honest truth for, it's like, Scott, if you and I, if, if you start up, started a podcast, say this was like your first episode and you were going to do seven episodes this week, like that's not sustainable for most humans. I would tell you not to do that. You're going to do seven every week. Like I, there's no way, man. I'm man. <laughs> there's no way. Right. And you yeah, might no be way. in that, but again, if, if you are, that's you. And I was right earlier when I said, you have massive belief in yourself. I think a lot of people do. I think what happens is it's like, I'm going to go to the gym for an hour a day, six days a week. And then I'm also going to track every calorie I eat. I'll weigh myself every day. I'll drink a gallon and I'll do 15 minutes of mobility. It's like, uh, -uh too much. No way. There's no way you can't do it. You do it once and then it's, yeah. it's over. There's no way that I really think that's, that's one of the issues that's ha that's happening is it's almost like, cause this is kind of what's happening. It's like, I'm going to spend, you know, in this, in this analogy, I'm going to spend a thousand dollars a day getting this goal. And it's like, after the first 21 days, you've just spent all of it. It's like, I don't have any energy left. I don't have any effort left. I don't have any commitment left. I don't have any discipline left. It's almost like to me, I think we optimize for too short of a period of time where it's like, I don't expect you to have any results 21 days in. I don't think you should either. That for me, it's, it's sitting somebody down and saying, look, I understand. I did this with somebody today. I did this with a podcast client. They're 55 episodes in, I think. And they're like, I don't know. It just like doesn't seem to be working. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's going on. And I said, what if you're not doing anything wrong? What if it just hasn't been long enough? Like, what is that? A Can you at least agree with me that that's a possibility? And they're like, yeah, but I feel like I should be, I sh should have so many more results. I said, based on what? And they're like, well, based on what other people have told me. I said, what if they're wrong? Are they podcasters? No. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. Are they, are they personal trainers? No. Well, they don't, you know, the, the, your family doesn't know how much weight you should have lost by this point. They don't, they don't understand that. So I think that it's one of those weird things, Scott, where a lot of us are, we're stepping up to the starting line and we think it's a, a sprint and it's a marathon, mm -hmm. but we have our sprinting shoes and we have our, we don't have enough water. We don't have the things that we need because we think it's a short journey. So what I would say is you have to try to at least say, okay, when I start something, am I starting it sustainably? That is the, I think that is the most important thing in the world because you can become consistent in something that's sustainable and then you can improve something that you're consistent at. If you're somebody who dabbles in stuff, it's probably because you're coming way too hot out of the gate. That's a big thing. And then I think the other thing is you ask for help. I mean, I understand it can be embarrassing or you can be ashamed of the fact that you, you know, I did it again this year. I only made it, I only made it two weeks in or three weeks in, but it's like, let's, there's somebody out there who is going through the same thing. Somebody out there who's struggling at the same rate you are. What if you reached out to them and said, Hey, can we do this together? I think that would be beneficial for both of us. I think that's, that's a big thing too, that accountability, it's almost like one of the accountability is one of the things that scares us the most, but oftentimes the things that scare us, scare us the most are often times the things that keeps us the most consistent as well. So I would say that use the stuff that scares you. Mm, I love that. And getting out of the gates, a perfect example. I mean, just think of them. If everyone just like visualize a marathon. If you sprint, I'm talking like go all out or even, even a fast run. That's not your pace. Like you're going to be cashed after three, four miles and be like, Oh my God, I still have 20, two miles left yeah. uh and it's like you can't fit and you can't finish you give up you walk away okay well you know whatever and and i think that's a great way to put it is that you just you're out of the gate too fast on whatever you might be doing like the road isn't built yet the road isn't there for you yet you have to build up to it which leads me to okay so building out habits then right building out habits to figure out kind of how you do it consistently over time to then keep it going because eventually you know, you're not going to be motivated to do anything. Like eventually it's not necessarily, motiv it's it's discipline. I think over time that gets you, I mean, I don't want to record every, you know, oh my God, I got to record that. Okay, fine, do it. I don't want to go to the gym today because it's zero degrees outside and it's windy and cold and rainy and I got to walk two minutes. And I'm not motivated, but I'm disciplined because I built those habits through small, consistent steps over t reasonable, sustainable steps mm -hmm. over time. Um, what would, in your in your opinion, what would be kind of the, you know, the way to build a habit, obviously through consistency, but are there any like keys that people should follow? It's like, what are some like ways that people can actually build habits uh, to sustain results long-term? Yeah. And again, so James Clear, Atomic Habits, one of the best books in the world on all this. So anything I say, I'm sure is going to be from that book. Uh, make it super easy to start. 
don't worry about going to the gym, worry about putting your shoes on. He literally mm. says that in the, in the book, like that is a great place to start. I think the, see, this is the, this is the hardest thing. One of the things that I talk about often is many people think that habits and habit tracking is going to create a more rigid life when in reality, it's actually going to create more freedom. It's free. That understanding is worth, is worth so much. I, so I track 26 habits, I think 26 habits a day. And again, been doing this for a long time. So that's not where I started. I literally started with five. And a lot of people might say like, oh man, it must take you all day. I can do it in three hours. And if, if that's all I wanted to do, I could get all my habits done in three hours and I could chill for the rest of the day. And I'm still making a massive amount of progress because I'm doing the stuff that matters the most, right? That's, that's the way it's designed. So I think it's one of those interesting things where even that, that deeper understanding that it's not going to form rigidity, it's going to form freedom is such an important perspective to have. That is huge. The other, the other thing when it comes to habits, other than like, I don't want to say something that's in Atomic Habits because I don't, I don't, I don't want to steal from they it. Might, but, but they might not have read it. So at this point, it's fair. I mean, it, yeah. So it's, it's Go, just good. going back to sustainability. I really think that's it. If you want to build a new habit, break it down into its smallest forms. Um, there's a lot of things that go into different things, like different pieces of success. So it's like, instead of worrying about getting up and going to the gym every day, focus on waking up and weighing yourself. Like that's progress towards an ultimate goal. Simple, simple. It's almost like you have to start building self-trust up with yourself with small things that the opportunity for failure is not super high. That, it, one of the reasons we're not consistent with habits is because we have not kept promises, made and kept promises to ourselves long enough where it doesn't become part of your identity. But when you wake up every day, say, say you do it for a month, you wake up every day and you weigh yourself. Then you start to think of yourself as I am the type of person who wakes up and does something valuable. I am the type of person who wakes up and does something that is health focused. Then you add something like tracking your finances every day. I am the type of person who wakes up and does something for my health, but I also do something for my bank account. Then say you, every night before you go to bed, you play the gratitude game with your partner. So you say one thing you're grateful for about them. They say one thing they're grateful for about you, or you just do it with yourself if you're riding solo. I am the type of person who practices self-love. Then it starts to get to your identity. And when things get to your identity, that's when it gets to the point where it's no, you don't weigh yourself every day that's not what it is. You're, I am the type of person who is health conscious. I am the type of person who is wealth conscious. I am the type of person who is wealth, uh, love conscious. That becomes part of your identity. So in the beginning, just make it as small as humanly possible. It's not as much about the output as it is about the feeling that you get when you do it. Mm, thank God. I, lo I love the habits build freedom, not rigidity. Mm. Uh, I, I think that's so just uh, people as a trainer in the field currently and People are shocked at the way I eat when I go out. I mean, they're like, you're a trainer. You you can't have a salad. I go, no, no, you have it backwards. It's because that I'm a trainer. I can eat whatever the hell I want because I understand what it takes because I have the habits built in to be, you know, to, to do what I need to do. So when I want to eat like crap, I totally can't. I love pizza. I love beer. I love donuts. I look up. I had the biggest sweet tooth. Like when there's extra food around, I'm the guy who eats it all the time because I do well 80% of the time. But it's not that I'm rigid. It's like, I don't need to eat like crap every single day of every single hour. It's, but when I want to, I totally have the freedom to do it. Yeah. It's not, it's not rigid at all. It's great. I love it. Uh, I love that. I think the people don't realize that you're not building a prison for yourself. You're, you're, building a you're a field, right? Mm -hmm. There might be some fences, but like you're building this like massive freedom for yourself. And it's like, when you build these habits, when you build the consistency and these small, and just to summarize a little bit, the small consistent steps that you make, and then basically telling yourself, you know, what you're doing and becoming that person, like that's how you build those habits long-term and then see those results and you change yourself and you mm -hmm. become more conscious, you become more self-aware. And that's how in atomic habits, that's how you change your life. Uh, yeah. And so I love everything you just said. And I think some of that's actually not from Atomic Habits, to be honest. I, I, I haven't heard some well, of that. You never before. know. You never know. It's like uh, you, when you read, there's a lot of books out there and a lot of them say similar stuff. Yeah. A lot of them say different stuff. So I want to make sure I give credit to Mr. Yeah. Clear when necessary. I love that. So what would be uh, two or three habits that are not podcasting related 
that you do that you think anyone could benefit from in, in terms of just starting to improve their life? Yeah, I literally, those those three I just gave. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, yeah. I literally, for me, every day I weigh myself. Every day I track our finances. Every single night before bed, my wife and I play the gratitude game. That, like, you want three simple things, you are off to the races. That. Uh, because the interesting thing is, a lot of us are like, I want to lose weight and I want to be more healthy. It's like, all right, that's that's a third of life. You know, you have money and you have love. Like, what are you doing there? You can break those up into systems too, right? Like, if okay, you measure what you eat. Do you measure what you spend? No. Okay, well, there's there's a great opportunity for growth. Is you measure the your relationship quality? No. Okay, there's another one. So, yeah, for me, it's like every day I weigh myself. Every day I track our finances. Every day I play the gratitude game with my wife. Every day I listen to something educational for 30 minutes. Yes, love that one. Right? Meditate. I try, I've try. i been mangling that lately, though. I have not been good about meditation. But every day, I want to, I want to meditate every day. And, and this is another thing. If you're like an entrepreneur, imagine if you messaged a prospect every day. It's 365 prospects at the end of the year. Like, that's a lot of people. So that, those are a couple... Very, very simple ones that read five pages a day. You know, Matt, you know, 365 times five, you, you read a lot of a lot of pages, a lot of books. But in, in, even to the original point, Scott, that's the thing is like when you're 21 days in, you're not even through a book yet. You're not even through a book yet. You're like, why am I doing it? Like, I haven't even finished this book. It's not about that book. It's about the, the pages. It's just the consistency of the pages. Just keep turning the pages. It doesn't matter about how many books. It's just you're proving to yourself that you can do something consistently. It's not even really about the measurement that you're getting, right? I don't. I think it's just important, just as important for you if you're out there to measure your bank account every day when you're losing money. Even if you're in the negative, it's probably more important to measure it because that's when you learn the habits and the tactics and the understanding and the emotional regulation then eventually when you have enough money or you have more money, it's easy to track your finances. It's easy to track your finances when it's in the green. It really sucks when it's in the red, right? Yeah. So that, that's the time to, to really learn it. But yeah, those are the ones I would say. I love that. And yeah, meditation has been something of mine. I'm, I'm just, I'm so on and off with I'm doing well right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's one of those things where I, I do great for like two months and I stop. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't, like, what am I doing? Like, I can't do it. So I got to get back on that. But um, where can people find you? I always send people to the podcast. I think that's just the best the best place where you'll get an idea of us. So Next Level University, we're on all the podcast platforms. We're on YouTube. Uh, Self-improvement in your pocket every single day from anywhere on the planet, completely free. So we do seven episodes a week. And then you can just search Kevin Palmieri on Facebook, LinkedIn, at Never Quit Kid on Instagram. Yeah, and all of that will be in the show notes. So you can Thank all you. just click on that and it's just, boom, you're right there. So uh, Kevin, before we sign off here, any final thoughts for the audience? Oh man. Yeah, we didn't really talk about this a ton today, but I mean, it's it's under mindset. A simple question. I like questions. That's just one thing I love. Ask yourself this question when you're ready. Are the people in your life the best from your past or the best for your future? A lot of us are spending time with people who used to be you know, our college buddy, they used to party with us. We used to go to the gym together. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying you should change anything, but will those relationships bring you to the life that you want in the future? Or are they the ones that are holding you back? That's a really powerful question that I wish I asked myself a little bit earlier in life. Oh my gosh, that uh, way to leave it on a cliffhanger like that. I can go, I want like, that's a huge topic to go into. Um, <laughs> Kevin, look, I appreciate the time. I appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, and thank you so much for the insight and, you know, just kind of everything, you know, all the knowledge that you're able to give us. My pleasure, man. Anytime. All right. Thank you.